Amen. The book of Revelation, we're going to chapter 21, and this is part 157. <laughs> Seems like this is all we've ever done, but no, it's just part 41. Someone called me the other day and said, do you have any more of those going on? I said, well, which one do you have? They said, we've got 38 or 39. I said, well, give us a chance to catch up with you. We're going as quick as we can here. But this is part 41, and uh, sadly, we won't get done with this chapter uh, tonight. There's too many good things here, and so I've kind of broke it in a place where I think it'll be good uh, to go back into some greater detail uh, next week. We're beginning in verse number 7, Revelation chapter 21 in verse number 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The word overcometh here is the word that we've seen many times in this study. And to the overcomer, this day has finally come. I'm confident that those that make it to that city on that day, there's going to be some shouting, there's going to be some rejoicing, and we will be declaring it was certainly worth it all. Whatever effort was needed to get us to that city on that day, it's going to be worth all. John said they're going to inherit all things. We inherit because the children of God are the heirs of God. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. The apostle Peter spoke of how we uh, have an inheritance. He said it was incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. Paul told us that the infilling of the Holy Ghost, he said it was the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14, which reminds us then that what we enjoy with the infilling of the Holy Ghost, it is only a mere down payment on the fullness of the inheritance that we're going to get when we finally see the Lord at his coming. Verse 7 said, he shall be my son. References uh, to the people of God being sons. He's not talking about it in the male gender per se. But many of these references to the sons of God can be found in the writings of uh, John and also Paul. John wrote in his epistle, he wrote, Beloved are now we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3 and 2. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Galatians 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul said, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, an heir of God through Christ. So if we're children or sons of God, then we're going to receive the inheritance that comes with being sons of God. Verse 8 said, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It appears here that after John has spoken about the blessing and the rejoicing that those redeemed are going to enjoy, it seems like this scripture is a little bit out of place here, but it's as though he wanted to remind us also that there is another place. There is another group of people, those that were judged at the great white throne judgment and they have been condemned to an eternity into outer darkness. One group, John says, is enjoying eternal life. But there's another group that's been plunged into eternal death. 
Verse 9, he said, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. The last time that John was uh, told to come hither was in Revelation chapter 17, uh, verse number one. The angel told him here to come so he could be shown the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. But now he's being called by an angel to come and witness the beauty of this city, New Jerusalem. The first angel, which could be the same angel here, told John that he would see the judgment of the wicked. But now the same angel or another angel, but it was from the same seven, is telling John he's going to see something absolutely mind-boggling, something beautiful. The first angel told John of the great city, which was Babylon. But this angel tells John of another great city, which is the new Jerusalem. And then John is invited here to see the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, we mentioned last week, this may be a little difficult to grasp, but just stay with me here. We mentioned last week that the bride was the city, and the city was the bride. You say, well, that don't make any sense. The Jews in Jerusalem were spoken of together. They were mentioned together as though they were interwoven. We'll quote a scripture on that here in just a moment. And so the bride, who is here called the Lamb's wife, is also apparently so interwoven into this city that's called New Jerusalem that they're linked here together. Now that's very important because we often have a conflict when we speak uh, using the terms the church and the bride. This is important. We also have this conflict of terms when we talk about the rapture and the coming of the Lord. We say it often, I say it often, we're looking forward to the coming of the Lord. But when I say that, just like you do, we're not talking about the coming of the Lord at the tribulation, the end of the tribulation period. We're talking about the rapture of the church. We use the phrase as a synonymous term, but it doesn't mean the same thing. The coming of the Lord to us is really, we're talking about us going to be with him. We're going to come back with the Lord to be on this earth, but I want to be out of here before he actually comes to the earth. I want to be gone in the rapture. I don't want to be down here looking up, seeing the Lord appear uh, in the clouds with his saints. I want to be as, John, as uh, the Apostle Paul said. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this mortal is going to put on immortality. We're going to rise to be with the Lord. We're going to meet him in the air. And that's what the hope of the church is. So when we speak of the rapture or the coming of the Lord, we use the terms together. And we often use the term as the church and the bride together. We often say, myself included, that the bride is the church, the New Testament saints. That is true in a sense, but it's not really completely accurate, especially in this context. Now I have your attention. I want to read here from Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to read several verses of scripture if you want to turn there. We're going to read Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to begin reading in verse number 8. I want you to notice this very carefully. Paul writing, he said, by faith... Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God." Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised, speaking of God. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, 
talking about the son that Abraham would have offered on the altar. He would have slain him, but he was dead in the beginning because they were beyond the years of childbearing. And from this one, even one, even him, as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. He was saying he didn't even have a son. He had no hope of the natural conception of a son through Sarah. And yet from the dead... God brought one boy, one promised son, one promised child, and through that one child, look up into the sky, look at the sands of the seashore, and you can see how innumerable his seed has become. Verse 13, he said, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. He was saying that the way was so difficult for them that if there would have been anything worth going back to when Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, they would have done it because the way was difficult. If you don't want to live for God, there'll be opportunities the devil will send in your path to get you to turn around and go back to where you came from. There'll be opportunities, but he said in verse 14, for they that say such things... They declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Jump down to verse 40. Verse 40 said, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So according to this passage, the Old Testament saints from Abel all the way to the New Testament saints, they're all going to be in the same city and in that sense, the Old and New Testament saints alike of all ages, of all dispensations of time, they are what is referred to here as the bride, the lamb's wife in verse 9. So when we talk about the bride of Christ, we are talking about this New Testament experience that occurred beginning on the day of Pentecost that's going to end with the rapturing of the church. But that's not the only saints that we're talking about that's going to be in this city. It's going to be the home of the redeemed, the righteous. So when you view this from this angle, the church will be a part of, of the bride. Every other redeemed group throughout the scripture, all the way from Abel, all the way to the last one that is going to be gathered with the camp of the saints that we read about two weeks ago, all of those are going to be a part of that same city. This local church is not God's church exclusively. This local church is part of God's international church. We are part of something much bigger than the number that assembles here in La Follette. You may live in La Follette, but you're only a part of the city. And so it is with the New Jerusalem. The church will be in that city, but the church is not the only ones in that city. Now, any person or persons that are described throughout our study, those that will be saved here, are going to live in that city. Um, they will be a part of the bride. They're not exclusively the bride. Now, this is very interesting here because the word bride, we use it a lot, but the word bride is actually only found four times in the book of Revelation. And one place it's used, it's used in reference to Babylon, the city of Babylon in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 23. The only other place in the entire New Testament that the word bride is found is in John chapter 3 verse 29. When John spoke, he said that he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. And we mentioned before in our study of this that John identified himself there as the friend of the bridegroom. He was not in the bride 
that we call the bride. Because John the Baptist was never baptized in the name of Jesus. And he never received the gift of the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues. He did not know about the New Testament experience. It had not been poured out as of yet. And so he called himself the friend of the bridegroom. In fact, it's interesting to note that there is no place, no place in the Bible where the word bride is directly relative to the church. No place. We do assume it's the church but we're making an assumption because the church are those that have taken on the name of the bridegroom in baptism. So we're making an assumption there, but there are also references to those in Revelation that have also been identified with his name, even to the point that they had his name written in their foreheads. We've mentioned several times in this study that we don't know what the salvation plan will be for those during the tribulation period or even those during the millennial reign. We don't know what it's going to be, but we do know there will be one. There's going to be some salvation plan there that will separate the righteous from the unrighteous. The Jews of the Old Testament were certainly people of the name. In fact, they were very careful and very reverent in the way they approached the writing or speaking of the name of their God. In fact, even today, if you get any Jewish publication, if it was written by any Jew, they don't even say the word God in a text. They'll spell it a capital G, and then they put a dash between that and a D. It's just G dash D. Because they're afraid that if they would put G-O-D, somebody might discard that piece of paper, and they would be afraid it might defile the name of God. And so they're very reverent in the way that they speak that. So they're certainly identified with his name. Verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Again, we have an interesting comparison here between what John experienced here and what he experienced when the first angel had poured out uh, the vials of wrath upon the earth. The first angel took him into the wilderness to view the judgment of the great whore. Chapter 17 of Revelation verses 1 through 3. But here he is said to be taken up into a high mountain to view the bride. To view the bride. The city of Jerusalem. Now I hope you caught that. John was told he was going to be shown the bride. But then he's shown a city, New Jerusalem. Because to those that inhabit the city, the bride, they're identified with the city just as the city is identified with the bride. It may sound confusing, but it was the same principle used uh, in the city of Jerusalem when it was de uh, described also being with the people of Israel. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37, he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered their chickens under her wings, and ye would not. He didn't say, O oh, Jews, Jews, O oh, children of Abraham. No. He said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He spoke of the city as though it was the people. In the same manner, the bride and the city here are linked together as the same. John's been carried away in the spirit before. It's not the first time we've come upon this. John was taken by the spirit on several occasions, but here he's taken into a high mountain to view this city. Now, we don't know what that means. How high could the mountain be? We don't know if he was taken up into a mountain to look down upon a city. That would have to be a pretty high mountain when you consider the dimensions of the city we're going to get into here in a few minutes because it's described as almost 1,500 miles high. It's a little bit higher than Everest. Some of you have no idea how high Everest is, so it don't matter to you. But here, it's called that great city. Folks, this is not just some little honeymoon cottage, a little mountain getaway for the bride and the groom. This is a city of tremendous 
mind-boggling proportions. John said it was descending out of heaven from God. So it appears that what John is witnessing here, it's the first time he saw this great city. And that's important because it does not appear until after the white throne judgment and the creation of all things that are new. So that would mean that this is not a city that was occupied by people during the millennial reign. This is brand new. It comes after that. Now, there's different opinions as to what's meant by descending out of heaven. Some believe it's going to be a stationary city that actually orbits above the earth. Some believe it's going to be a city that descends down upon the earth and it's planted with foundations here. John said in verse 24, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor to it. Also in verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations to it. Someone said, well, that certainly means that uh, if we consider the statement in a literal sense, then the city would have to be established on the earth if kings are going to bring glory and honor to it. Not necessarily, because the Bible said that we will be kings and priests unto God. And that's going to be the habitation that we're going to be in. And Jesus told his uh, disciples, he said, if you're faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. We're also told, Jesus said, we will rule and reign with him. We, he is going to be king of kings. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. We might be the kings they're talking about. So the kings may be us who are going to rule and reign with him. We're going to be ruling and reigning somewhere. If we're ruling and reigning on this earth, maybe the capital city for us is in the sky. There's some things here we're going to consider both points of view, but I'll tell you before we get done with it that there is no clear answer because the Bible doesn't give us a clear answer about that. Commentators have suggested concerning the boundaries of this city that if it were on the earth that the boundary of this city would reach from the northern tip of Maine to the southern tip of Florida and from the shores of the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the borders of Colorado. If it were on the Atlantic Ocean side, the other side, it would cover all of Britain, Ireland, France, Spain, Italy, Germany, Austria, Turkey, and half of Russia. Pretty big city. <laughs> Gives a new meaning to I'm just going across town. It won't be long. <laughs> Those who spiritualize the city that say it's a symbolic place, there are those that do that. However, there is no scriptural reference. We can't find one anywhere that would support the idea. If God is the creator of all things, if the God that we serve, if he really was able to create and hang all of the planets in the solar system in their perfect order, he could keep them there for eons of time, everything orbiting in its right orbit, everything going on like God intended. Why would it be so hard to imagine that the same God could create a city somewhere in the heavens and bring it, bring it down here to this earth? He can do anything. There's nothing that limits this God. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. There is no reference here. We can't find any to cross-reference that it would be a symbolic place. Every single reference I can find speaks of it as a literal place. We're not going to some misty, foggy room. We are going to a real place. In the book of Hebrews, we have a reference here to the people of the Old Testament that seek for a city. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16 said, but now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared them a city. And this word city here has no uh, uh, no symbolic reference. It is a literal reference. It actually, there is no place, according to scholars, that this could be pointed to as a symbolic city. So they, in the Old Testament, were looking for the same thing we're looking for. Something beyond the grave. Some place that we're going eternally beyond the grave. Now verse 11 said, Having the glory of God in her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. I want to look first of all here at this phrase, the glory of God. 
We read in Exodus chapter 40 and verse 34 that a cloud, the Bible said, covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That was the same glory of the Lord that would later fill the temple that Solomon would build when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the Holies of Holies. And there it was called the Shekinah glory of God. It was a glory that even at the time of Moses and the time of Solomon, it was so powerful when it filled the room that the priests were not even able to enter into the tabernacle or the temple to minister there until the glory was lifted. We can't even imagine that. It's a glory, a power that's so, that's so powerful and beyond humanity that no human could endure in the presence of such glory. And yet in the new creation, that same glory is going to fill that city and it's going to spread forth into all the earth. We're going to be able to handle it then because we're going to have a new body. John witnessing this beautiful sight, he said here that her light was the glory of God which shone forth from the city was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now the phrase here that's a little bit unusual, I've got a piece of jasper stone somewhere, a friend of mine years ago was a gemologist. I was teaching on this very subject years and years ago. And he gave me some stones, didn't give me no diamond, but he gave me other stones that he could get and portions of those to show me what it was. And jasper is certainly not transparent. And so because the phrase here said that it was as clear as crystal, most scholars suggest that the jasper stone mentioned here is probably what we would call today a diamond. A diamond that catches all the rays of light and shine through its many prisms. It will be a light that dazzles the beholder. I don't know if it's a transparent uh, a jasper, if it's a diamond, we don't know well, for sure what that's going to be, but it's going to be an awesome place. Verse 12 said, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and the gates 12 angels and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Of course, the wall that's built around this city will not be for the same reason that it's built, been built in times of antiquity because it's not there for protection. There's not going to be any enemies to those that dwell in that city. It's not going to be there for their safety or their protection. In fact, if you read on, we're going to talk about uh, later on in the study that the Bible will say later on that the gates of that city were never shut. The walls are not talking about a place of protection necessarily. It may be speaking to us of the security that's going to be in that place that will be enjoyed by the redeemed. It's a place where there's never going to be any more fear. Then John said the gates had 12 angels or as some call them, it's heaven's welcoming committee. John said here there were the names of the 12 tribes of Israel that were written on those 12 gates. So Israel is here being identified with the city as having the names of all 12 tribes written on the 12 gates. Mr. Morris in his commentary, he said, but also the names on the entry gates will be an eternal reminder that it was first of all through the ministry of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, with the 12 sons of Israel, that we Gentiles first entered into the great family and city of God. I'm glad for the New Testament church, but had there not been someone with the faith of Abraham, we may not have been here today. Verse 13 said, and on the east, there were three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. On the west, three gates. If you look at that arrangement, it reminds you of the encampment of Israel and even their marching orders, their encampment around the tabernacle during the wilderness travels. Because according to the book of Exodus, there were three tribes camped on each of the, the four sides of the tabernacle. According to Numbers chapter 2, we also have record of that. As far as whose name, names are on these gates, that's where we're going to have a difficult problem. When you consider the list of the 12 tribes that are numbered in Numbers chapter 2. We've covered this before uh, several lessons ago. You'll notice that 
the two sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, are included in Numbers chapter 2, in this number of the twelve, and Joseph is omitted in favor of his two sons. The tribe of Levi is also omitted here, since they were the priesthood, they were not supposed to be numbered with the children of Israel. And then when you go to Revelation chapter 7, we have the 12 tribes. There was 12,000 that were sealed out of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the names listed there are different than the names listed in Numbers chapter 2. Because in that list, Ephraim and Dan are missing. And in the original listing in Numbers chapter 2, we have Joseph and Levi that are mentioned here. And Levi was not supposed to be mentioned there. So when you then consider the prophecies of Ezekiel, he described the city of Jerusalem during the millennial reign in chapter 48. He also listed the 12 tribes of Israel and the names of all of the 12 tribes that were written on the gates of that city during the millennial temple. In his listing, we have the names of the original 12 tribes, though they're not in the order of birth. So what I'm saying is that we have three separate listings of the 12 tribes and none of them agree. You could say, well, which one's going to have their name written on those gates? We'll have to ask when we get there because the Bible doesn't say. Some make the assumption that it will be the original 12 because they were the actual sons of, of Jacob, but the Bible doesn't say that. We just don't know. Verse 14 said, and the wall of that city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles or the 12 uh, apostles of the Lamb. Now, the fact that the names of the apostles are also mentioned here, listed in this city, it also emphasizes that the city includes both Old and New Testament saints as well. Paul made it plain that the foundation of the church, it included Old Testament saints. In Ephesians 2 and 20, he said, and we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. As far as who the 12 Names are going to be recorded on these foundations. There's no question about 11 of them. We know who 11 of them are going to be. But as far as the one that took Judas' place, Judas Iscariot, that could certainly be open for debate. Some scholars believe it'll be Matthias, the one that was chosen by the apostles, by lot, to replace Judas. Others believe that it will be Paul who was called the one born out of due season. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. However, their names are not mentioned here either. John tells us they'll be the names of 12 apostles, but we're not told what those names are. And so that, again, we'll have to wait till we get there to find out. The bigger question really is about the 12 foundations the wall having 12 foundations. Mr. Morris, in his commentary, he wrote on this verse, he said, as the wall has 12 gates, so it also has 12 strong foundations, deep and secure, transmitting the weight of the great wall down to the solid bedrock of the new earth. One foundation at each corner, plus two in each wall, located between the wall's three gates, is no doubt the pattern employed. Of course, we're not sure as to what's meant by John's statement that the wall of the city had 12 foundations. We do know the singular term is used in reference to the wall, but singular terms are also used in reference to the street of gold in verse 21. And since there are 12 gates, it would certainly appear that there would be more than one street in a city that is 1,500 miles long. End of quote. Verse 15 and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. Of course, John is just is speaking here about the angel that had just carried him into this high mountain to view this great city. The angel now produces this golden reed. He's going to measure the city. The angel is going to measure the gates and the walls. Now, we're not told how that was done. In fact, can you imagine how long it would take to measure with a reed? 1,500 miles. We don't know how it was done, but whatever it was, when John saw it, it was boggling to the mind. I think it's also important here to note that when you read about the symmetry of this city, the metropolitan areas, all the layout, all of this that's done in this city, it's not built randomly. 
It wasn't built without a plan. Every material is properly measured and placed in its right position. The architecture is absolutely a perfect skill, no flaws. And then he said in verse 16, and the city lieth four square. And the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Vincent, who is a Greek scholar, he said that the 12,000 furlongs would be 1,378.97 miles. This is where we get the term, the city is approximately 1,500 miles long, broad, and high. It's approximately because of furlong, there's no way to know what that really is in our measurement. But we do know that the city is a cube because the height is equal to the base, the height, the width, it is all the same. If you talk about cubicles in measurement uh, for things that were holy, it's not something new in the scripture. In fact, we consider both the Old and New Testament, the tabernacle and the temple, both of those had holy places, and the holy places were all cubicle in size. The Bible simply called it four square. Even the breastplate that the priest wore, the Bible gave the dimensions and said it was four square. So the cube or the four square dimensions, it was meant to identify with the holiness and the perfection of God. That inner sanctum that God chose to dwell in and manifest his glory in the tabernacle and the temple, it was cubicle in its dimension. And with this verse, we're now beginning to see the magnitude of this uh, size of this city that the redeemed are going to live in. Now, how long it would take to explore this city of gold when uh, each one of its streets are one-fifth the length of the diameter of the earth is certainly mind-boggling. G.T. Haywood wrote about this city in 1923. Just give me a few minutes. I'm closing with this in just a few minutes. This city, he said, has 12 foundations or floors, each being separated by a distance of 125 miles. Now, what he's saying is there's 1,500 miles square, and then go up 125 miles, and there's another 1,500 miles square. Go up another one, and you're continuing to do that until you have this square box, and it's got 12 layers or floors. He said the city has 12 foundations or floors, each being separated by a distance of 125 miles. However, there's nothing said about elevators or staircases there because there will be no need for such, for they that dwell therein will be equal unto angels. The second floor would be out of sight of the natural human eye. Each floor or foundation would bear the name of one of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Were that city divided into rooms one mile in length and one mile high and one mile long, it would contain 3,375,000,000 rooms, each room containing the space of one cubic mile. One of the most astonishing features, he says, about such a place is that it would take, in the time that it would take to visit or go over that city, uh, if you visited each room separately. If we would go through the city spending one hour in each room for 24 hours a day nonstop for 6,000 years, we would only have visited 52,570,560 rooms, still leaving 3,322,529,440 rooms still left to be visited. To bring the calculation down to a smaller point, if you just spend one minute visiting each one mile square room at the end of 6,000 years, you would have visited 3,155,233,600 rooms, still leaving 210,766,400 rooms still unseen. We're going to spend a lot of time. Somebody wrote a song years ago, said, look for me, for I will be there too. <laughs> I wonder if heaven will be like the, uh, the mall. You walk to that place and it shows you a dot, you are here. 
And then you start looking for names in the list. <laughs> yeah, I see you, but uh, I, I may have uh, another six or 8,000 years before I can come around if I just spend one minute. That's just enough time to run into a room and high five them, say, it looks great, and go on. What a place, what a place. Also need to mention here, there are those that disagree with the 12 floors uh, being the 12 foundations, and we'll get into that more next week. But uh, they argue that since John wrote here that the wall of the city had 12 foundations and did not actually say that the city had 12 foundations, they believe that it was the wall itself that was being spoken of here. However, there are those that would say if the height of it was the same as the width and the breadth, then only 12 floors or levels would make any sense. I'm going to talk about that more next week. But there's no mention of any, just like uh, G.T. Haywood said, there's no mention here of any uh, means of travel in that city. We don't know if we're going to have segways, just lean into it. If you're going to have a little economy, Toyota cars, of course not. There's no mention in that city of how we're going to travel. Whether it's going to be vertical or horizontal, uh, apparently it's going to be just as easy any way you go. We don't know what it's going to be like, but when you start stopping and pondering about something like that, a place like that, those that enjoy the privilege of living in that city, uh, they're not going to need any kind of transportation because we're going to have a body like that of the Lord. He appeared through the wall. He could be at one place and then gone again. We're going to travel somehow at will. Going vertical is not going to present any more, any more problem than going horizontal. Whether we choose to travel 15 miles or 1,500 miles uh, across the city, it's going to be the same. It's going to be an awesome awesome experience. Next week, we're going to talk about the details of that city, what it's made of, some more about the dimensions of it, and perhaps uh, even what the uh, size of it is going to be or the look of it is going to be. I've got a little picture. If I can find it, I couldn't find it today, but a pretty interesting artist conception of what that looks like, and we'll try to uh, bring that next week to show as well.